So let me tell you a little bit about me. Now, I was born a physicist a long time ago <laughs> uh, in, uh, in London, in England. Uh, and I uh, spent, I qualified uh, in London, and then I spent a couple of years in Cambridge uh, as a postdoc, and then back to London, then to Newcastle, always in, th in physics or theoretical physics uh, with applications to cosmology. Somebody said to me the other day, what's cosmology anyway? Um, and uh, I said, well, it's the sort of thing that Stephen Hawking does. Now I understand. Uh, and so that's what I do, uh, and in particular, uh, the application of the theory of quantum fields to black holes and the very early universe. So I've spent most of my career puzzling over deep questions like how did the universe come to exist from nothing? What are the laws of physics? Where do they come from? Uh, and uh, how is it all going to end? And where do we, uh, human beings, fit into the great cosmic scheme of things? The subject of astrobiology uh, is the study of the origin, distribution, evolution, and destiny of life, wherever it may be found in the universe, not excluding Earth. And at the moment, Earth is the only place that we know has got life, but uh, the hope is that we will find it somewhere else, maybe on Mars, maybe farther afield. And I began working in astrobiology as a sort of hobby in the early 90s, uh, when, uh, by which time I'd gone to Australia. I spent uh, 16 years in Adelaide and then Sydney, uh, partly working in astrobiology. And I came to Arizona State University five years ago to set up the Beyond Center for Fundamental Concepts in Science, which stretches across all these many interests of mine. Uh, and uh, I have um, no uh, qualification in biology, apart from once throwing Francis Crick out of a bar, but that's, a, <laughs> that's another story. I want to hear that one. Uh, most of my, my work in, in biology, the astrobiology, really is uh, concerning such things as if there's life on Mars, could it get to Earth inside rocks? Uh, but the, the fundamental problem that astrobiologists face is we have no idea how life began. We have an excellent theory about how life has evolved over the last three and a half billion years on Earth, uh, from simple microbes to the complexity of living forms we see today. Uh, it's Darwin's theory of evolution. I'm sure you've heard of it. Uh, so we know the mechanism that causes life to evolve. We have no idea what brought life into existence in the first place. So that's a tough problem that really interests me, and I have a, a postdoc uh, working on that at the moment. Uh, so uh, hopefully within a year or two we'll know the answer. No, that, but, but, but that's a really tough one. And inevitably this leads you to think about uh, what is it? What is that thing that has, comes to exist or came to exist three and a half, four billion years ago? Uh, this thing we call life. It's very hard to define it, very hard to pin it down. And so uh, in thinking about how life originates, it forces you to think very deeply about the nature of life itself. And in looking for life elsewhere, you have to ask the question, what do you look for? You send an expensive spacecraft to Mars or Europa uh, with some life detection package. What are you looking for? And so astrobiologists are very good at thinking deeply about what is life. Uh, and incidentally, it was a physicist who wrote the book of that very title, What is Life? It was Erwin Schrodinger in 1944, wrote uh, his famous little book that is said to have triggered the revolution in molecular biology. Uh, so I became involved in cancer research purely as a result of a phone call from uh, Anne Barker, uh, then the deputy director of the National Cancer Institute, and she and the then uh, director, John Niederhuber, uh, had uh, come up with a plan uh, to maybe get scientists from other disciplines, even those who had no previous experience in cancer research, uh, to come to the party and to lend their insights. Uh, and in particular, uh, they wanted physicists to, uh, to come and help. Now, physicists have been involved in cancer research, of course, right from the outset in things like diagnostic and treatment, you know, x-rays and beam weapons and uh, other uh, devices, but that's not what they wanted. What they are really after is uh, to ask physicists to uh, tackle the cancer problem by thinking about it, looking at it through the eyes of a physicist. And the physicists solve problems in a certain distinctive way, and they, the hope was that we could lend the insights from problem solving in areas such as uh, physics to cancer. And I was asked to provide an example of where uh, physicists have been stuck on a deep problem and eventually managed to solve it by real out-of-the-box thinking. Uh, because I, 
I think it's obvious to everybody here today that more of the same research might lead to incremental advances, uh, but that if we're really to crack this cancer problem, we need some radical new concept. So it's not just a matter of uh, making a discovery, a new drug or something. We have to change the way we even think about the nature of the problem, about the nature of cancer. What is cancer? I'll come to that in a moment. Let me give you this example from physics to show you what I have in mind. Uh, so Isaac Newton gave us this wonderful uh, theory of gravity. Uh, I'm sure you all learned it at high school. Uh, and it uh, wonderfully predicts how the planets move around the sun. But there's always a problem about Mercury, the innermost planet. Uh, it almost but not quite complies with Newton's theory. It's out by 43 seconds of arc per century, a tiny discrepancy, but one that astronomers were familiar with in the 19th century. And so they puzzled and puzzled, and they thought there must be another planet between Mercury and the sun. And it was given the name Vulcan. And astronomers went to look for Vulcan, and from time to time they reported seeing it crossing the face of the sun. Uh, but it was very difficult to verify these observations, and so Mercury's orbit remained a stubborn mystery until 1915, when Einstein produced his general theory of relativity. Uh, and this theory is a theory of gravitation, but it's completely and totally different conceptually from Newton's theory. Newton describes gravity as a force pulling between two objects. Einstein describes gravity as a warping or distortion or curvature in the geometry of space-time. No force, just a warped geometry of not just space, but space-time. Uh, in the solar system, it gives results which are almost identical to Newton's theory. But in the case of Mercury, it differs from Newton's theory by 43 seconds of arc per century in the precession of its, of its orbit. So it's a great triumph in 1915 when Einstein was able to explain this discrepancy, not just by tinkering with Newton's theory, but claiming, uh, by changing completely the conceptual basis in which gravitation is described. Uh, and that's the, the point I want to get across. How can we think about life in general, and cancer in particular, by changing the conceptual basis. Now, uh, 150 years ago, most people thought that the living cell was some sort of magic matter. And we still use this quaint term, organic chemistry, as if the chemistry inside living things is different from chemistry outside of living things. Well, it's not. It's just carbon chemistry. We, we now know that. The atoms in your body are just the same as the atoms in the world around us. And they do what atoms have got to do. Uh, but the reason uh, that uh, the living matter looks so, uh, so remarkable and to a physicist looks almost miraculous. It's not the stuff of which we are made, but the way it's put together, the complex organization. So around about the 19th century, uh, biologists began to think that living cells were bags of exceedingly complex chemicals. And it took them decades and decades, and they're still at it, trying to elucidate the complexity of that madhouse within the cell, of all these complicated molecules interacting with each other and pathways and things like that. If you've ever seen any of these things, you know uh, what the, the London Underground map looks like. And if you imagine 100 of them superimposed on each other, that's what a, a, a map, uh, say a metabolic pathway or something uh, inside uh, the cell looks like. It's just horrendously complex. And then about 60 years ago, the, the said uh, Francis uh, Crick and uh, Jim Watson uh, showed that there's another way of looking at life uh, in terms of information, information processing. And so we have the whole genetics revolution. So we now think in terms of genes and uh, copying of information and mistakes in the copying and editing and uh, mutations and so on. Uh, so we have these really two ways of looking at the cell. Three ways, if, you, if magic matter, but we don't believe that anymore. Um, uh, complex chemistry and genetics. But there's a third way. The cell is, is a physical object. It's a thing. It's got a mass. It's got a size. It's got a shape. It's got a density. Uh, it has uh, pumps and levers and uh, chains and other paraphernalia familiar to engineers. It's a me mechanical thing. Uh, when cells move around the body, uh, they, they have to deploy forces like anything else that moves. Now, I'm sure everybody's aware that 90% of deaths uh, from cancer are caused by metastasis, not by the primary tumor. If you've got a primary tumor and it just stays where it is, well, you can deal with it. But once it spreads, you're in trouble. Now, cancer spreads because the cells have got to get around. They've got to get around in the bloodstream or the lymphatic system. They have to burrow their way into organs where they, they make a home. 
uh, and we need to understand that as a physical process. So when I was asked to help set up one of these uh, physical science oncology centers, we decided to dwell on uh, two things. One is thinking about cancer cells as physical objects uh, and trying to uh, control them physically as opposed to with chemical or, or genetic means, physical control of cancer cells, that's the first thing. Uh, and the second thing is to run something, I run this thing called a, grandly called a cancer forum, which is like a think tank brainstorming sessions. We hold workshops about three or four times a year, and we bring together people, uh, not just from within the cancer research community, but from outside as well. You see, and I set great store, for example, by bringing in astrobiologists, or physicists who, like myself, have never really thought too much about cancer, to lend their insights. And the, the point about astrobiology is an important one. When I first got into this subject, it seemed to me that most cancer research was done by um, uh, cell biologists uh, who paid very little attention to evolution. Now, when you look at cancer in the, uh, in the biosphere, almost all multicellular organisms have cancer. It's not just a human disease. It's something that pervades the biosphere. Uh, and when you uh, study the oncogenes and the tumor suppressor genes and try to reconstruct a phylogenetic tree, what you find is that this goes back hundreds of millions of years. Uh, in, in other words, cancer is a manifestation of the price that cells are paid uh, for joining a multicellular community. If you imagine you're a single cell two billion years ago, one imperative, replicate, replicate, replicate. But now you join a union and you have to subordinate some of your rights to the union. Uh, and in particular, uh, we now have, with the emergence of multicellular life about, uh, about 1.2 billion years ago, the emergence of multicellular life meant that individual cells could no longer just replicate when they liked. They had to obey instructions for the larger um, assemblage. And about uh, this uh, period of getting to organize cells into uh, large assemblages went on for some hundreds of millions of years until about 600 million years ago uh, we get modern metazoa with their many differentiated cell types and the body plans that we're familiar with today and the, the different organs and so on. Uh, so to understand cancer we've really got to go back to that period between 1.2 and 600 million years ago. And so the thing that, that struck me, I could go on all night, you're going to have to stop me because uh, I find this so exciting. But I just you know, want to give you a hint at, at, at our thinking. Um, so when I first uh, was presented with all the uh, dismal information about cancer, it's, it's often said that cancer cells are cells that have gone wrong. Uh, but to me, it seems like uh, cancer is cells that have gone right. They're very, very good at what they do. They're incredibly good at what they do. Uh, very impressive. Uh, and so it seems to me that uh, all of the survival traits that they deploy in a systematic way, and I don't want to list them all here, but you're familiar with the various hallmarks of cancer, um, that this is not just a series of unfortunate accidents, uh, it's something that's deeply uh, programmed into the nature of, uh, the, of the cell itself. Uh, so I'm exploring the idea uh, that cancer is an atavism. That's, uh, atavism is a term biologists use when someone is born with a tail or gills or something like that. It happens very rarely. And that's because in the embryo, we, the, as the embryo develops, we go through the various stage, evolutionary stages that represent our past history. So that the early embryo looks a little bit like a fish. Uh, and then uh, these uh, features are, uh, are lost uh, when the baby is born. But these early stages are simply because we've inherited the body plans that go back hundreds of millions of years. You can't get rid of them because that's sort of laying the foundations for the building, so to speak. Um, and so I'm exploring the idea that maybe uh, with cancer what happens is that the toolkit of genes, which springs into action at the very earliest stage of embryo development, uh, the, the first cell differentiation, and then gets silenced, still inside us, uh, it springs open again. And the reason cancer looks such a formidable enemy is because it's systematically uh, deploying all of these very carefully honed uh, survival strategies which were learned between 1.2 uh, and uh, 0.6 billion years ago, a long period of evolution. So it's evolutionarily selected for. It's, we don't want it now, but back in the so-called Proterozoic, that was the way that cell assemblages got built. And I think if you got in a time machine and went back a billion years, you'd see lots of tumors 
the, the organisms around you would look very much like uh, tumors. Loose assemblages of, of well, of uh, partially organized cells. And, uh, and so, trying to develop that idea, I'm just going to give you one other idea that, uh, uh, before bringing this to a conclusion, uh, to give you uh, just a, a drift of, of the way we're trying to approach this problem. Uh, that uh, I mentioned that cells are, are physical objects and wouldn't it be good if we could control these cells by physical means? Uh, and I really do believe that we don't have to cure cancer. We don't even actually have to understand it. Uh, what we've got to do is stop it spreading, spreading uncontrollably. We have to slow it down. <laughs> and, and it's really not necessary to, to elucidate that London tube map 1,000 times over. Uh, in order to get to grips with this. And so we're looking at the possibility that as cancer makes its way around the body, it's very vulnerable, and that if we can understand the physical forces between the cells and the cells and the, and the surrounding tissues and the motility of these cells in the bloodstream, if we can understand this, we may have a way of controlling it uh, by physical means. And if instead of one in a million cancer cells making a home in another organ and causing mischief, it were one in 10 million, Maybe that's the problem put off for, for 10 years, 20 years, something like that. So that's, that's what we're thinking. Uh, and many other, other thoughts too. I just want to close with a statement about, because a lot of the discussion here has been about the financial organization of research and so on. Um, you, don't, you, you won't solve a problem just by throwing money at it. You need some, some brain power. That's the important point. One of the things that I have found in this field is that uh, a typical scientist working at cutting-edge cancer research is probably spending about 40% of their time reporting, fill it, filling out forms, grants, recruiting people, uh, re recruiting administrators to administer all of the rules and regulations. Uh, in my view, it would be better if, to have less money but have it completely unrestricted and just let the scientists who really have the good ideas go with it and see where they get. Not, not infinite amounts, but some substantial fraction should be freed up from all this paperwork and bureaucracy uh, just to let the scientists get on with the science because that's where the solution will come from.